Good morning, everybody. This is Reese Barrick, and I'm here at the Dome talking to you in your home, hopefully. And I'm trying to remember today to have my phone flipped sideways, so we'll see how well I do with this. Um, but we're here this morning, and I had a couple of things that I thought I would mention as we get here. Today, we're going to talk uh, and, and look at uh, our minerals and rocks. So we thought I would talk about that and maybe even sneak inside our fluorescent mineral case and see how that's working. Um, flipped the lights on today, so hopefully everything is set and ready for us. Um, a couple of things to remember, let's see, tomorrow morning, if you join us, I'll have Alicia, and she's gonna feed our big Sonoran Desert Toads, which will be a lot of fun. And tomorrow afternoon, instead of our dome from home, we've got uh, our How to Draw a Dinosaur. We'll have a link, Rachel will have a link on Facebook, I think today, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow afternoon, where you can join a famous paleo artist, um, uh, Julius Chutney, and he will teach everyone how to draw a dinosaur, which will be a, a whole lot of fun. So that will be happening tomorrow afternoon, as opposed to our typical um, Dome from Home series that we'll have. So that's just a couple of fun updates. Today, or this morning, I thought we'd, we've been talking about fossils, we've been having lots of live animals, so I thought maybe we'd talk about a little more of the earth itself. I always like the earth and life on earth, earth history. So I thought we'll talk a little bit about um, the geological portion of the planet for a little bit. And we've got some exhibits here and I thought we'll walk through a little bit. And if you have questions anywhere in here, you can feel free to ask, but sometimes there's uh, fun things and even some questions about rocks and minerals. So this is part of our mineral exhibit and minerals um, are specifically naturally occurring inorganic solids that have a specific chemical compound and that chemistry is homogenous throughout the whole mineral. All right, so and the chemistry basically creates a crystal structure um, and a color and a hardness. So we've got a number of minerals here. And the main thing is, yes, there has to be naturally occurring solid and uh, a constant, consistent chemistry throughout the whole, um, the whole mineral. So for example, and they take all kinds of different shapes and colors. If we look really closely over here, there's dun, 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 one that you can see through. That's calcite. Calcite looks like a rhombohedral and it can be often perfectly clear and you can use it, you can see directly through it and it offsets lettering, so you can, which is kind of fun. Um, we have things that can be bright yellow, that's sulfur. Um, <laughs> we have some cool things like this guy down here, it looks all kind of stringy, um, which is white and it actually gets very fibrous when you peel it apart. That's uh, serpentine. Actually, that's not what that is. That's the, that's the fracture. That looks like asbestos. <laughs> um, let's see, what else do we have here? We've got some malachite, which is green, and azurite, which is purple. And those are copper minerals, which is kind of cool. And then over here, we've got things like one thing, 23 here, looks kind of like the, 
the calcite that I showed you, <clears throat> except that it's perfectly square. It has rounded corners, and that's rock salt. Stick your tongue on it, and you will taste salt, which is really kind of a fun thing. Salt is a natural mineral with uh, sodium and chloride. Mm -hmm. And over here at 22, we have some fluorite, mm -mm -mm, which is calcium and fluorine. So the main thing is that all of these minerals look fairly sort of constant. They have a crystal structure and a, and a constant color. And then we've got some things that we call minerals a lot, like 16 over here, which is copper. But that's actually just the element copper. When you have a native elements, um, native elements are just the one element. That's copper. So that 16 doesn't have a crystal structure. Native elements like gold, gold and native copper and native sulfur don't have a crystal structure. Um, they're just native elements. So a mineral is made up of a number of different elements and the consistency of the in a crystal structure gives you a mineral. Okay. Now if we sneak back around this direction, we can get the difference and see the difference in what we call a rock versus a mineral. Rocks themselves are made up of minerals. So for an example over here, we have a rock that is granite and you can see it's got some pink and white and black in it. And that pink, white, black is in the rock of granite is made up of these minerals. There's quartz, there's some feldspar of orthoclase is white, plagioclase is pink, and biotite is black. So if you take all of these four minerals and they get combined into a rock. So rocks are made up of minerals and minerals are um, naturally occurring solids that have a consistent chemistry. Okay, so that's the main thing. Rocks are made up of minerals. That's kind of cool. And we have a number of different kinds of rocks. Rocks are basically formed, we talk about a rock cycle, and rocks, uh, most rocks then originate are igneous rocks, and they come from the uh, molten part of the Earth's surface uh, that cools off. And so you have molten rock, melted magma types of things um, from different deeper parts of the earth. And as they get to the earth's surface, they start to cool. And when they cool, all these different minerals start to crystallize out and they form together making rocks. So igneous rocks are basically these primary types of rocks. It's kind of cool. And you, well, it's actually pretty hot. And as these igneous rocks are formed, there's, you can sort of tell different types of them. For example, if you have rocks where you can see the crystals fairly well, like in number one up here, then you have rocks that cool down very slowly. There is a chance for each of the mineral crystals to grow fairly large. Um, so these would be things if the magma is rising slowly in the earth, there's a chance for the crystals to grow before they get solidified into a rock. And as the rocks, if they get shoved up to the surface of the, of the earth a little bit faster, individual crystals don't have as much of a time to grow, so you get very more homogenous type rocks, um, like number two here. So number two is a rhyolite, number one right above it is a granite. They are rocks of the same composition. It's just one got to the surface faster, number two, and so it cooled more quickly, so crystals didn't get to grow as fast. Um, you also can have, for an example, um, different compositions of igneous rocks. So uh, rocks that, that uh, 
have a, a composition that's of much, generally speaking, heavier minerals or minerals that start to crystallize at higher temperatures are generally uh, a little bit more black with big crystals. That's gabbro. It's got large crystals, but they're all black. And if they get to a, a, a rock composition like this that gets to the surface fairly quickly and it has very little crystals, then you get a basalt. So basalts are ocean rocks that got to the surface quickly and cooled off. Gabbros are ocean rocks that really um, stayed deep in the crust and got larger crystals. Um, igneous rocks, for example, are not igneous, but uh, granites are more terrestrial. They have much uh, different mineral composition, so you get more of the pinks and whites as well as the blacks. So you can tell that they were um, completely different compositions of magma. So they're more rocks that we see in mountains, uh, terrestrial rocks, as opposed to rocks that you see that are deep ocean rocks or that you see um, basalts that come out of lavas from places like Hawaii. All right. Um, and rock, uh, igneous rocks that get to the surface extremely quickly, like get blasted out into the air in volcanoes, are glassy, like number nine, which is obsidian, um, or ash, like number eight, so you can get volcanic ash, or glassy obsidian, or we have things like pumice, um, which has a lot of gaseous holes because they got blasted out into the air and crystallized so quickly that you not only don't get big crystals, you get big air pockets in the rocks, right? So here's an, a, an example um, of a vesicular basalt, something that got blasted up into the air, and you can see all of these nice um, air pockets that got... I mean, the thing rock basically froze instantly and preserved all the air pockets in it, all right? So, cool thing, igneous rocks get to the surface really quick. They're glassy. They get to the surface semi-fast, very small crystals, and if they go really slowly, they get a long time to cool. You get big individual crystals of different minerals that make up the rock. What happens to igneous rocks? Eh, they get to the surface, they get exposed to weather and rain and all kinds of things. And the weathering and erosion of igneous rocks turns them into sedimentary rocks, okay? Sedimentary rocks are things like you find in rivers and lakes. Um, and there's fairly simple things that you can look at sedimentary rocks. The closer they are to the source that they were eroded from, the larger the grains or the chunks, the boulders, the cobbles um, of the rocks that got eroded, they get put into new rocks. And so if there's big chunks, they're fairly close. They're basically at the foot of the mountain where they were eroded. And if they didn't travel very far, those big chunks are very angular. So we'd call a breccia. And if they traveled enough to round off all the uh, cobble, then we just call it a conglomerate of different sized rock chunks that were conglomerated together to make an individual rock. And the sediment travels before it turns into a rock. The, f the finer and smaller the grains are. <laughs> A sandstone, which is most of the time just quartz or silica um, into very much smaller grains. And we have nice beaches to go play on until it gets turned into a rock. And even smaller things, we can get um, shales, which are basically made out of mud or mudstone. And different types of sands and shales can be found in different environments, whether it's rivers, lakes, or beaches. And sometimes they sit at the surface and get exposed to air and you can get cracks in them. So we have an example of mud with mud cracks. 
And sometimes you can get these types of mud cracks and they can end up getting buried. And sometimes then you get minerals, right? Going back to minerals flowing through the water that precipitate out. And you get things like the septaria nodule or this geode where you have minerals that precipitate inside of a rock. So you might have a mineral inside cavities of clays or sandstones. So you get a nice cool combination of rocks and minerals. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna take a little walk around the corner here. Now we know a little bit about rocks and minerals. Come over and check out a cool mineral collection that we got a year, couple years ago um, from Richard and Pam Green, um, who he's a, a geologist, has a, a, an amazing place in Missouri. It has a huge collection of minerals from around the world, and he donated them to the museum. And I just thought we'd take a look because some of these are pretty cool. <sighs> one of the sad things is I came up here and found out that one of our cases, the light's not working. I kind of wanted to cry, but as Tom Hanks said in A League of Their Own, there's no crying in baseball. Same thing, there's no crying in So. No crying in museums, so we'll come over and take a look at some of the cool minerals we've got here. And we have one area here where we have minerals. Minerals are often mined. They can be used to make things. We make all kinds of cool things. Um, so this beautiful orange mineral up here is called orpiment. And orpiment is used as a yellow pigment. So um, orpiments made out of arsenic and sulfur. So you don't want to put it in your food, but you can use it as a pigment. Um, we've got, let's see, da, 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 da. rutile, which is kind of uh, yellowish and uh, mineral that's titanium oxide, which is kind of cool. can be used, titanium is used in a lot of uh, things like your bicycle. It's also used as pigment and jewelry. And one of the cool ones that I like here is muscovite. Muscovite is a mineral found in um, igneous rocks at the top of uh, magma chambers. A lot of times you get a lot of muscovite that has a chance to uh, or uh, uh, crystallize and it's a really cool flaky mineral used in cosmetics. Um, this particular one happens to come from Brazil. We've got silver. Now this is native silver so that's an element as opposed to a mineral itself but we use that obviously in lots of coins. Dun, dun, dun. And right above that, we've talked uh, in a different place, we saw some fluorite. Fluorite's beautiful purple, big sort of uh, angular square crystals. And fluorite, we obviously use a lot in toothpaste. Helps out our teeth. And down here, we have quartz, which has a cool, um, interesting mineral shape. Uh, this is smoky quartz, so it's dark, but quartz is used in making glass and making mirrors and all sorts of abrasives, especially if you really want to um, shine up or clean up something, you can get uh, quartz to sort of abrade and take off paint and other things. But biggest use is in glass. A lot of times uh, you go to beaches and they scoop up sand and they use that to melt and turn into um, glass, all of our glass. Well, beaches, the beach sand is basically made of quartz. All right, so a number of very cool, we've got, here, 
which is a copper mineral, as is azurite, which is a deep blue, and they both have copper in them. What's really cool is copper with carbonate is this beautiful green, um, or it can be turned into a really beautiful blue, which is kind of fun because native copper itself is kind of a rough sort of bronzy golden color. And yet throw it with some carbonate and some hydroxides and you get beautiful blues and greens. Whoa, we got some flashing lights over here. Um, come over here and we have other colorful crystals, right? We've got some, one of the things about many crystals of minerals is they can be different colors, right? So the crystal shape is always the same in minerals for the most part, but their colors can be different because sometimes there are small substitutions in the chemical composition of minerals. And so that leads to different colors. So for example, we showed you a smoky quartz over there. It was dark gray. Well, this is also quartz and you can see it's kind of orange yellowish and that's called citrine. Um, but it's got a slightly different color. Most quartz should be perfectly clear like this variation of quartz, which came from Arkansas. You get some quartz that can be purple. All right, amethyst is purple quartz. And the interesting thing here is that amethyst can look a little bit like fluorite. The only thing that's different is the crystal structure. So uh, amethyst or quartz and amethyst is, again, silica, silica dioxide. Right, where this fluoride is uh, calcium and fluorine. But they can still be purple. There's some more amethyst crystals, which is kind of cool. Um, dun, dun, dun. Oh, we had this orange gypsum. Gypsum is generally white, and it's calcium sulfate. And dun, 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 dun. calcite, we talked about calcite as being clear and you could read through it sometimes. Well, calcite can be different colors too with a little bit of yellow. Here's some light green, and we can get some sort of more reddish or black calcite. So there are substitutions that can make colors change. So color is never really the best way to identify a mineral. You're better off looking at crystal structure. <laughs> Here's some fluorites. Oh, there's the purple fluorite. Looks a little like the purple quartz. And here's a bluish purple, and here's some more um, light blue fluorite. And you can get some fluorite that's green. <laughs> and up here we've got some, a eh, little hard to get colors here. I should, would have to take the glass out to be, have it be a little better, but here's some garnets, which are minerals found in igneous rocks. And one thing I forgot to mention that I thought was kind of cool, I forgot to look down here. Oh, there's pyrite, which looks gold colored, but it actually has a crystal structure. So that's not gold. That's why it's called fool's gold, because it's got a gold color. But over here, we have galena. I always thought Galena was from Galena, Illinois, but there's a Galena, Kansas. And Galena is lead. Basically, it's lead sulfide. And it can be, has very, very cubic crystals structure. So you can see this overall big block is sort of a cube, but even individually, when you look at it, it breaks off into cubes. So Galena, interestingly enough, that I had to bring it up. It is the state mineral of Kansas. Um, just in case you didn't know. So this is kind of a cool, fun, um, important mineral to Kansas. Um, 
it has obviously lots of uses. Some of them we try to get rid of, like lead in paint. Um, we don't use lead shot anymore. We have enough you know, poisoning of ponds and things from using it as out shooting ducks and things and having sort of lead poisoning out in the environment. On the other hand, um, it absorbs x-rays really well. Lead is used to protect us every time we go in to get x-rays and things like that. So um, lead's a very cool and it's the state mineral of Kansas. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, we had some flickering lights here, but anyway. Oh, now you can see me in the background. Hi, everybody. Um, do, do, do. Some other cool minerals. We have things that, these are called, look like roses. They're called desert roses. That's barite, which is barium and sulfate. And they can take all kinds of different forms. Barite does. Uh, forms in deserts, oftentimes. Um, more calcite and aragonite and up here got the beautiful greens of malachite and this is native sulfur which is bright yellow I had to put the green and the yellow together because as many of you know I'm a Packers fan so I had to put the green and the yellow together all right I'm going to step into one last place and this is our uh, dun, 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 dun. fluorescent mineral case. So here we have rocks. So we have rocks which, and some of the minerals in these rocks will fluoresce. What the heck does that mean? What that is that... Um, <laughs> colors, the color of light we see is in a very, right? So a lot of what we see is in color of color are the colors that are reflected as opposed to being absorbed by different um, objects. And in minerals, what's interesting is that when they're hit by ultraviolet light, better nope. that um, not great internet in here but for some uh, minerals they have when they're hit by ultraviolet lights electrons and their atoms get shoved and moved and when they're moved they change energy and they're trying to get back to the level where they used to be and so if you turn the um, as they're supposed to be they give off light and that allows things to fluoresce so here we go you can see here's beautiful greens and oranges and blues. And here's one of my favorites. Oops. And some of these things will even fluoresce a little bit or phosphorus afterwards. So all of these minerals, right, are rocks with minerals in them. And like I said, you hit the ultraviolet wavelength and you move electrons around and moving those electrons around gives off different bright colors. So they look very different. So this is one of the sort of fun favorite places to come in the museum because there's lots of beautiful rocks under electro. Whereas without the ultraviolet radiation, they just look like fairly bland rocks. All right, we're cruising around to the end, but I thought we'll end with one last cool place. And that's over here, Ta -da -da. meteorite area. So meteorites are fragments of asteroids. 
they get blown off and they get caught into the atmosphere of Earth and fly down so, uh, and smash into the Earth. And so they're basically space rocks. So we have all kinds of cool space rocks here at the museum um, and different types of them. Some are stony, some of them are metallic, um, have a lot of iron in them. Um, all of these uh, are asteroids that you see in front of you now are from Kansas. Um, there's a number of fields in Kansas where lots and lots of uh, meteorites have been collected, which is kind of cool. Um, other types of uh, evidence of space rock interaction with the planet are these things, and they look, some of them look like teardrop shaped things, right? Those teardrop things are called tektites, and they're actually melted rocks from Earth when the, a large meteorite or smashes into the Earth and it sm basically melts a lot of rock and throws it up into the atmosphere where it cools very quickly, like we saw with the igneous rocks. And they cool so quickly, they basically capture this sort of teardrop shape. And so they're remelted earth rock from after an asteroid hits the planet. So that plus then the actual rocks from space. And usually we preserve the ones that were much smaller that hit so they didn't actually melt too much of the earth when they hit it. So meteorites are awesome space rocks, and a lot of them um, have been used to be dated to show that pretty much all the rocks in our part of the, the universe and solar system are about the same age in the nearly five billion year old range, which is kind of fun and interesting. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Hope everybody was able to see most of this fairly well. Um, but that's sort of our ideas of looking at rocks and minerals. So hopefully it was a little fun. Uh, maybe you learned a little something. And I sort of enjoy getting back to this place and talking about part of my, a lot of my early training in geology. Um, rocks and minerals are kind of cool things. Um, just as much as fossils and live animals. But we don't often talk about them as much, so I thought we'd just devote a morning to rocks and minerals. So remember, tomorrow to check your links, you can get onto how to draw a dinosaur um, for tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna be feeding some toads, so that's always a blast. Alicia's always a lot of fun, because um, she's gotta be here to take care of the animals, because guess what? Uh, animals are here whether there's uh, coronavirus flying around or not. Uh, maybe someday we should talk about viruses too. That could be kind of fun. Anyway, this is the dome coming to your home. Check in this afternoon to uh, listen to Ian. He should have more fun things to talk about. Uh, I'm going to throw my hand in there. Anyway, uh, enjoy. Have a great day. Give us a like, give us a share, and we'll see you tomorrow.